Hello, hello. What's up, everyone? Billy Carson here for Betting Knowledge. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the origins of religion. You know, a topic that you guys know is near and dear and passionate to my heart. <laughs> so, I merely state facts. And I'm hoping, you know, that these facts that I'm stating are going to help awaken some people and make them want to ask more questions. That's the purpose of this whole thing. I want people that have been born into a system that is designed to mentally enslave them to start to look for the keys to the doggone cell because they can let themselves out. Uh, you know, and, and what's happened is when you're born into a religion, you kind of get this, um, I get this concept or this ideal that this is what you have to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to be letting down family members. You're going to be letting down loved ones and so forth. And, and you're not going to be able to be a part of anything. It's actually all false. You can still be a part of things. You can still, uh, you know, create a new reality for your loved ones. You can still be a part of things. It's just that what, what's happened is when you're born, you're given that, that name, that race, and that religion, and then you spend the rest of your life really, you know, defending a false identity. And so we have to start to dispel some of these, uh, these crazy concepts, because if we don't dispel these, these, these falsehoods, we're going to persist generation after generation after generation after generation with this mental enslavement uh, with no real truth. No real information backed by actual historical fact that has been left behind by our own ancestors. This is not like stuff that I make up. And I think that's the difference between me and a lot of other people. I'm always giving you guys the information and I'm telling you where it comes from so that you can become your own researcher. You can discern the information for yourself and you can make your own decision what you believe. You know, that's what it's all about. We're going to break down some of the very beginning structures of religion and, you know, pretty much how it got started. All right. So we're going to get right into it, guys. The origins of religion. All right. You got your tea. What you're looking at here is a Melanesian cargo cult. Cargo cults um, are known literally all over the planet. And the largest cargo cult is Christianity. That is the largest cargo cult, okay? This cargo cult has its roots going back all the way into the time of the testing of bombs and, and the wars when the U.S. military will go to these islands and in these other foreign countries, and they would test weapons. They would test nukes, believe it or not. Bikini at all, they blew up the damn island. They moved the people off their own island and blew up the damn island. I mean, there's so much stuff with you that's crazy. But in the midst of this, in the midst of these islanders had never seen um, anyone before other than themselves, really. They saw, start, started to see airplanes, weaponry, military soldiers walking with guns and rifles. They started to see, uh, you know, uh, the USA you know, across the chest of the uniforms that the uh, military wore. And also the military would, would give them corn beef, cans of corned beef hash, bottles of water, uh, MREs, you know, uh, you know, uh, and, and those kind of things. And so it was like the gods, in their eyes, the gods were blessing the tribe and bringing them these gifts for them being good people and so forth and so on which led rise to prophets and everything else, right? You can see here that this tribe is still walking around with USA tattooed on their chest or painted on their chest, really, with these artificial guns that are just sticks that have, you know, bayonets on the edges like they used to see when the military came there many decades ago, okay? So what happens when an advanced civilization meets a less advanced civilization, the lesser advanced civilization it looks like this civilization is magical. They don't understand technology. And what do we do? We deify them instantaneously. They're deified. That's it. They're gods. They have to be gods. There's nothing else. There's no other 
thing it could be. These are gods because we don't understand their technology. <coughs> Let's look at Cargo Cult. Let's look at the term itself. The reason why I'm reading this and add, I add this stuff in is so that you guys don't say, oh, man, he's just making this stuff up. No, no. This is from the uh, Anthropology Encyclopedia. Cargo Cult. The term appeared in 1945 at the end of the Pacific War. Anthropologists rapidly embraced the neo glism to, to label Melanesian social movements that had come to their attention during the colonial era, which began in the region in the second half of the 19th century, as well as post-war movements that captured uh, ethnographic attention. A Southwest Pacific example of Messianic or Millenarian uh, movements was once common throughout the colonial world, and the Modal Cargo Cult was an uh, agitation or organized social movement of Melanesian villagers in pursuit of cargo by means of renewed or invented ritual action that they hoped would induce ancestral spirits or other powerful beings to provide. In other words, what they're saying here is once these military soldiers started coming to the island with this cargo, in other words, these cans of, of uh, you know, these MREs and these, and these cans of corned beef hash and and bottles of water and soda and all this other kind of stuff and, and clothing and things. That's what they call cargo. And they thought that they, by calling on the ancestors, they can make these gods return and bring them more blessings. Okay. <clears throat> sound familiar? <laughs> Does it sound familiar to you? Typically an inspired prophet with messages from those spirits. Sound, sound familiar? Sounds like a preacher, right? Here goes the preacher man getting ready to, to do his thing. Inspired prophet with messages from those spirits persuaded a community that social harmony and engagement in improvised ritual, dancing, marching, and flag raising, or revived cultural traditions would for its believers bring them cargo. Okay? So what they're saying is this guy would then become the leader of the cult. He would become like the prophet, right? He's the pastor or the preacher, whatever you want to call it. And he is leading the dancing, the ritualistic dancing, the marching, raising of flags, and so forth and so on, basically in honor of these gods so that they would bring back more cargo to bless the tribe, okay? That's, that was the whole thing behind this. This has happened so many times around this planet, you know, you can't even count. I mean, I'm talking going even all the way back to Roman. Roman countered back in Roman, in the Roman era, when they were a super kingdom on the planet, and their technology to us right now would be damn near Stone Age. But to, to the people of the era, they were super high tech. So when, even when they encountered people with their level of technology, they looked like gods. It's the same thing that happened when Christopher Columbus accidentally got lost and kind of stumbled across <laughs> those islands and, and got saved by Native Americans, indigenous people. Not, I don't want to I don't want to use Native Americans by indigenous tribes and then decided you know the tribes automatically assumed based on a prophecy that these were gods you know coming to returning basically and and they and they they praised these people and brought them on to the island and everything else and they ended up getting raped and killed right it's the same thing that happens all over the planet it not only happens all over the planet i think it happens throughout maybe even the entire universe that's my personal opinion that's something i'm just adding i I believe if we ourselves went to another planet and we came across people that were in the Stone Age, they would worship us almost instantly. That's just my opinion based on what I've seen researching these cargo cults. Okay. So um, this is pretty interesting stuff. Look at these photos right here. You see these boys? They're already being trained now. They're being indoctrinated with the ideology of this belief system from birth. So now they're walking around with painted chests that say USA on them. They've got these artificial guns with bayonets at the tip, right? They, they, they're marching through the streets as if they're soldiers in honor of their God so that they can bring back more cargo. Again, like I said, the way religion starts is a, a more advanced civilization interacts with a lesser advanced civilization. The lesser advanced civilization deifies them and then... When the next generation comes, they're indoctrinated. They're indoctrinated into this system. And 
personal inflections uh, are added to the myth, um, you know, lies, fabrications, things that can put people in positions of power over other people are added in as well. And then gradually, little by little, you have this, this self-made prison being built where the people that are in the religion are the prisoners and they're also the prison guards at the same time, which is pretty interesting. You can see down here in the lower left corner that these people actually even replicated one of the planes that they saw the military landing in with the propeller and everything. You can see this flag that they made, right? They're very, very uh, astute people. I mean, these are intelligent people. But again, the thing that eluded them was technology. They didn't understand it. And so because they didn't understand it, it became deified. And because they're very artistic, they were able to replicate all of this uh, in this fashion. And this is one of many cargo cults that existed around the planet. Look at this. Check this out. Look at these planes. These are an honor. Look at this satellite dish. Look at the intricate level that they went to to build this communications device that's really just made of straw and and tree limbs and, and grass probably or whatever look at the intricate design here to work look how hard they work to build this thing you know and so what they would do is they would go out and pray underneath these these objects that they built and look up at the sky for hours hoping for the gods to return anthropology or cultivated a number of important keywords including culture ethnicity worldview socialization um uh, ethnography and the rite of passage among these terms is cargo cult which although more particular in scope has enjoyed surprising popularity both inside the discipline and beyond peter worsley who compiled an early overview of cargo cults in the trumpet shall sound which is a book offered what had already become the standard definition of cargo cults strange religious movements in the south pacific during the last few decades in these movements a prophet announces the imminence of the end of the world in a cataclysm which will destroy everything. Now, this is coming up. This is uh, what this uh, this author, Peter Worsley, had observed. OK, listen to this. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Tell me if this story sounds similar. These are people who never heard of the Bible. Strange religious movements in the South Pacific appeared during the last few decades. In these movements, a prophet announces the imminence of the end of the world in a cataclysm which will destroy everything. Then the ancestors will return. Does this sound familiar to you guys? I'm just asking. Does this sound familiar? People who never heard of Jesus and the Bible and none of this stuff. Then the ancestors will return or God or some other liberating power will appear, bringing all the goods the people desire and ushering in a reign of eternal bliss. Won't he do it? Hallelujah. You see? These are, this was written in the 1950s, this book. This is an observation by an anthropologist who traveled to all these cults and realized they were all doing the same exact thing. The same exact thing that all religions are doing today around the entire world, pretty much. They are all going through the same exact process that I just described to you. A prophet announces that there's the end of the, it's the end times. There's a cataclysm coming, right? To destroy the world and Christianity, it's going to be destroyed by fire this time. The first time it was destroyed by water, now it's going to be destroyed by fire. But then there's a second coming. There's a return of the God that's going to come and liberate everyone who believes in him and who worships him properly. And you're going to get the eternal bliss. You're going to get eternal life. It's the same story. It's the same story. What's different? It's just the different advanced civilizations that meet up with the lesser advanced civilizations. That's what it is. And that's how you became your, your ancestors or your, your parents or your brothers and your sisters and your cousins and all those people. That's how they became religious. Let's check out this video, this two minute video. Hey guys, you see what I'm talking about? <laughs> if you look into the, uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, you discover again a situation where Human beings deify uh, people that came here from somewhere else. So we know that Thoth, according to his records, that he's not from Earth, just like a lot of these other 
uh, people that worship these particular gods in different religions, which we're going to look at tonight as well. They don't. They all claim to not be from Earth. And what's interesting is when these gods with a lowercase g, when they leave, they become deified. Let's look at the uh, just a few paragraphs here in the preface of the Emerald Tablets. The history of the Emerald Tablets in the following pages is strange and beyond belief of modern scientists. Their antiquity is stupendous, dating back some 36,000 years B.C. The writers, though, an Atlantean priest king who founded a colony in the ancient Egypt after the sinking of the mother country. He was the builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza, erroneously attributed to Cheops. In it, he incorporated his knowledge of the ancient wisdom and also securely secreted records and instruments of ancient Atlantis. For some 16,000 years, he ruled the ancient race of Egypt from approximately 52,000 B.C. to 36,000 B.C. At that time, the ancient barbarous race among which he and his followers had settled had been raised to a high degree of civilization. So they visited some people a very long time ago and raised them up to a high level of civilization in the land of Kim. Thoth was an immortal in that he had conquered death, passing only when he willed and even then not through death. His vast wisdom made him ruler over the various Atlantean colonies, including the ones in South and Central America. We know that for a fact because over there he was known as Quetzalcoatl, Lord Pakal, Kukulkan, uh, and many other names. Lord, you know, Veracocha. When the time came for him to leave Egypt, he erected the Great Pyramid over the entrance to the Great Halls of Amenti, placed in it his records, and appointed guards for his secrets among the highest of his people. In later times, the descendants of these guards became the Pyramid Priests, by which Thoth was deified as a god of wisdom. What's interesting in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, he never claims to be God. Thoth never says, I'm God, or I'm a God, bend over and worship me. Get on your knees, man. Now, matter of fact, he lifts people up and says, no, I'm a son of Atlantis. And so he never says that he's a god. That's one of the things that I actually appreciated about this guy. And I do mean guy. He's not a god. The, a lot, some of his relatives pretended to be gods. They masqueraded as gods because they found it was a lot easier to get the people to worship them, to do the work without them knowing that they were slaves. Right. But Thoth was actually opposite of that. He did the work for the people, helped the people, instructed the people, taught the people, and lived amongst the people as a normal person, even though he was seen as an extremely wise man. Once he left the area, the, any particular region, any one of the ones he, he kickstarted, he kickstarted many civilizations around the planet. He became, after he didn't come back for a certain amount of time, he became known as a, a deified god. This is what we do in our culture as, as a human race. We start to deify these people that we don't understand because they seem smarter than us. They seem wiser than us. They seem uh, like they have abilities that we don't have. We don't understand technology. We don't understand spiritual sciences. We're just starting to tap into through quantum physics, understanding spirituality. We're just at the very beginning stages of this. And we're talking about people that are a million years ahead of us. How do we, how do I tie this into the modern day biblical information? Well, there's UFOs throughout the entire Bible. Again, more evidence of people running into situations where they're, they're seeing advanced technology and they're trying to use the words that they actually know in their language at that time in that era to describe what they saw. In actuality, what they've been describing many times over and over again throughout the entire book uh, is um, our technology, technological devices, and people using or sometimes people inside of those devices flying around. So are there descriptions of UFOs described in the Bible? Yeah. Keep in mind, the Bible translators go uh, far back as the 1600s. And basically what I did was I went through and instead of doing every single one of these verses, okay, uh, what I did was I said, let me just count the number of these particular items that appear to be technological. So there are 70 verses that are, that are describing clouds as vehicles. There are 15 verses that describe pillars as vehicles, 10 that describe dwellings as vehicles flying in the sky, 160 verses 
that are lights and fire as vehicles. There are 17 verses that describe spinning wheels that can fly. 22 verses that describe dark and shining objects that fly. There are 37 verses of various objects in the Bible that are described as UFOs. And basically, they're like flying furnaces, burning bushes, eagles, wings, smoke, stars, and other objects. And also, don't forget the first fleet of the Elohim. Okay, which is a plural number and plural name for God's plural. Elohim is a plural term, and it's referencing referencing the Elohim are uh, from the Enuma Elish and the seven tablets of creation. They're known in the Atra, the Epic of Atrahasis as well as the Ejiji. That's the Elohim. They're the Ejiji. Okay, that's a whole other thing to get into. So virtually all religions either worship aliens. Or believe in aliens and they don't even know it. And so when I talk about this, people seem to get really offended right away. They, they don't realize that they're, you, they're worshiping aliens. I mean, they're, it's admitted by them that they're worshiping aliens. They don't even want to admit it. So let's have, the def let's, let's have a look at the definition of alien, right? A resident born in or belonging to another country. Well, we know that. An entity from outer space. Okay. Hmm, interesting. An entity from outer space. Now that the definition is clear, let's take some look at what the religions on the planet uh, say and what their origins are. Christianity, 2.1 billion people worship Jesus. Okay. And John said unto them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Not from earth. You're worshiping an alien. Islam, 1.3 billion people believe that the prophet Muhammad was meditating in a cave of Hira by himself when the angel Gabriel, which is not who's not from earth, according to Gabriel, descended and came down from above to him and told him to recite the Akra, the words of God, even though the prophet Muhammad was illiterate at the time. He actually had to go hire a doggone guy to scribe for him because he couldn't even write what this angel slash alien was telling him that came from space down to the planet to the, to the planet's surface to talk to him. Hinduism, 851 million people believe in that. Hindus hold that the cosmos is populated by numerous deities and spiritual beings, gods and goddesses or divas, who actually influence the world and who interact with humans. They're not from Earth. They're not from Earth. Buddhism, 375 million people. OK, the deities say certain branches of the larger Buddhist tradition, including the Mayana, including uh, a variety of gods and goddesses that are not from Earth. Mormons, 13.5 million. The angel Moroni, who's not from Earth, according to angel Moroni uh, in Mormonism, is an angel that visited Joseph Smith on numerous occasions. Beginning on September the 21st, 1823, according to Smith, the angel was the guardian of the golden plates which the Latter-day Saints believe were the source of the material for the Book of Mormon buried in a hill near Smith's home in western New York. This is just to name a few. Every single one of these religions believe that the people that they're worshiping and then honoring and everything else and praising and praying to are not from Earth. Their origin didn't start here. If I get into a spaceship and I fly to Mars and I meet somebody on Mars, that lives on Mars. This is a hypothetical. I'm just making up a hypothetical for you. Then that Martian person is going to look at me and say, I just got visited by an alien from Earth. I'm an alien to Mars. I'm an alien to anywhere else that I go in the universe. Why? Because I'm not from that exact location. I'm from here. And so by that definition, all of these people that are religious are all worshiping and praying to aliens. I don't care if you feel it. I don't care if you believe they're physical or non-physical corporeal bodies, multidimensional. It doesn't matter. They're not from Earth. They're aliens. You're worshiping an alien, period, point blank. All religions worship aliens or believe in aliens, and they don't even know it, period, point blank. There's no way to escape it. There's no way to run and hide from it. You're worshiping an alien. That's what you're doing. So just embrace it. Embrace it if you're going to be involved in it, right? So, you know, you have another more modern cargo cult, the peculiar history of the Jehovah Witnesses, right? That's a more modern cargo cult. We know how Christianity got started and how they went off. 
right? I mean, how did Christianity get spread around the world? Let's think about that for a minute. Christians will tell you that it was spread around the world by love and the gospel, the good news that had to be spread around the planet, right? That's not how Christianity got spread around the planet. Christianity got spread around the planet by raping, pillaging, killing, murdering, right? Stealing. That's how it got spread around the planet. During the papal inquisitions alone, which spanned over 700 years, where the popes themselves ordered the killing and the murder of anyone who would not align with the church. And so they, the inquisitions, they went literally globe, you know, continent hopping, and they killed over 50 million people over the course of 700 years under the order of the popes that ruled in those eras. The papal inquisitions, look it up. That's how Christianity got spread around the planet. How did it get over here to the Americas? Well, the Spaniards came over here and the Europeans came over here and beat and raped and killed and slaughtered. So what they would do is they would go to an indigenous tribe and they would take the, sh the chief or the chiefess or whatever, and they would bring them out in front of the whole you know, group of people, the, 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 um, you know, the tribe. And they'd say, you know, you're going to learn this. And if you don't want to learn this religion, then we're going to have to kill you. And so, of course, after some going back and forth and learning some of the basic understanding on communication, a lot of these tribesmen would be like, no, this isn't for us. We're going to maintain what our ancestral belief system, our spirituality. So what they would do is they would take that chief, that chiefess, and they would actually burn them at the stake in front of the whole tribe, hang them and torture them for days in front of the whole tribe. And so it's you're shown basically that if you don't fall in line, that could be you. And so once they do that, it's like breaking a horse, right? They take a horse, they put it in a in a gate, a gated area, and they literally work with that horse until they break it, until that horse can be ridden. It's the same exact thing they did with people around the planet. They went from continent to continent to continent to indigenous culture, indigenous culture, indigenous culture, one at a time, knocking them down, taking away their um, their uh, their their na their natural uh, ancestral belief systems and reinstalling this new Christianity belief system instead, building churches there, torturing, killing, raping. It was a very bloody situation, and they used it to convert this planet into Christianity. It was very bloody, very 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 murderous, uh, very heartbreaking. Really, is what it was as well. And so after you break the first generation of people that you're there with, then the second generation is being now taught, listen, this is what we got to do. By the third generation, they're full swing. They're coming in. They're born in with that illusion. They're born with the lie. They're taught from birth. They're worshiping. They're honoring. They're bending over and on their knees and begging and praying and giving offerings and everything else. By the fourth generation, they don't even have to think anymore. It's just built into them. They're automatically doing it. You see? Um, Jehovah Witnesses, the same thing. The sect now known as the Jehovah Witnesses was started by Charles Taze Russell, who was born in 1852. He was raised as a congressionalist, but at the age of 17, he tried to convert an atheist to Christianity and ended up becoming converted instead, not to atheism, but also but but to agnosticism. Some years later, he went to uh, an Adventist meeting and was told that Jesus would be back at any time. And he got interested in the Bible. The leading light of Adventism had been William Miller, a flamboyant preacher who predicted that the world would end in 1843. Oops, another mistake there. When it didn't, he discovered the uh, his mathematical error, basically. He said, I screwed up. I made some bad calculations, so forth and so on. But a lot of people left it. But this guy, Charles Taze Russell, decided to move on and build his, his whole, um, you know, his whole religion from scratch which is the jehovah witnesses he started with uh with the little magazines the watchtower magazines and he built it from there literally okay and this is a more modern uh religion it's one of the newest ones that actually exist on the planet the bible itself that they read from is a completely uh converted and rewritten bible words taken out words changed around paragraphs changed uh 
narcissism added in in some places, some places taken out. I remember I was, um, <laughs> let me go back to the screen here. Let me, I remember I was walking on the beach, okay? And <laughs> I was where I go and do my five mile walks. And there was a, a group of, uh, you know, Jehovah Witnesses out there and they're screaming and carrying on and trying to stop people. I said, well, let me just stop. Let me just stop because I need to see how much do these people know about their own religion. And so I stopped and the lady started talking to me and she started telling me about Jehovah Witness and, and Jesus and all this other kind of stuff. And I said, okay, interesting. I said, I'll listen to you if you can answer some of my questions about your own religion. So she goes, oh, yeah, sure. What do you want to know? I said, uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is the person that founded this, um, this religion? She couldn't answer the question. She literally couldn't answer the question. I said, okay, well, that was Charles Taze Russell, uh, who started with the Watchtowers. I started asking more questions. Like, what year was your Bible um, redesigned and, and basically written? Because it's not the original text. It's not the canonized Bible. She couldn't answer the question. I said, hmm, interesting. You don't know that either. Okay. Uh, I, asked her, <laughs> I asked this lady so many questions. She couldn't answer any of them. Um, and I said, tell me about this 144,000 that you guys are always talking about. They're going to go to paradise. They don't call it heaven. They call it paradise. And she says, well, you know, only 144,000 are going to make it to paradise. And so I said, 144,000. Hmm. Interesting. I said, well, how many people do you think there are on earth? She said, oh, about three or four million. I don't know. I said, three or four million. There's three or four million people in Florida where we are right now. There's three or four million people in this state. I said, do you realize that there's 310 million Americans? She goes, what? I said, yeah, there's 310 people in a million in people in America, and there's 7.8 billion people on Earth. Her eyes got big. I said, so if only 144,000 are going to make it, that's less than a tenth of a percent. Why would you be telling this to anybody? Shouldn't you be keeping this a secret for yourself so you can be one of the ones that make it? Do you understand that you're spreading the information on what you believe is only 144,000 going to make it? Meanwhile, there's 7.8 billion people on the planet. So your odds are shrinking every time you talk about this. <laughs> she went crazy. Oh, my God, I can't. You can see her computer circuits burning up inside of her brain and her brain's almost literally exploded, right? So, again, a lot of this stuff is just, why is she doing this? You just, you know, again, people are force-fed this stuff from a young age, and then they take it as a belief system, and they run away with it without ever researching any of it. I remember I was on the beach. Again, the same beach. I was sitting at the edge of the ocean. I had just got done doing my walk. Sometimes I sit at the edge of the ocean and do myself a little meditation. I'm sitting there with my eyes closed, and I'm just listening to the ocean. And that's my that's my that's my music, right? A guy and a, and a woman walk over. I don't see them walk over because they walk up from behind me. But all of a sudden, I hear the sand shifting by my body. I open my eye, turn to my left. There's a guy standing there. Right away, when he handed me a bottle of water, I said, "Oh, here comes another one." He was trying to convert me into Christianity, right? He hands me the bottle of water. I said, "You know what? This time, I'm gonna take this damn water. I'm gonna have a conversation with these people." And the guy goes, have you taken Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I said, no. Why would I do that? <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? I said, I, I am God. You're God? What are you talking about? I said, yeah, I'm God and God is me. The same divine spark that created everything in the entire universe is the same divine spark that's inside of every atom inside of my body. And so by that method, I am God and God is me. And so are you. And so is this young lady as well. We're all the same. We're all part of that same one divine consciousness. That threw him off right away. Then he, because he's a program code, he couldn't even conceive of what I had just told him. He didn't even have an epiphany with that. He went right back into his pitch. And I said, okay, I'll listen to you if you can answer some questions. Can you answer some questions? And I said, when was the Bible written? And he goes, oh, it was written thousands of years ago. I said, oh, <laughs> man. I said, no, the Bible wasn't written thousands of years ago. I said, do you even know who wrote the Bible? Oh, yeah, Paul, Peter, John. I said, oh, my God. Listen, man, 
I said, you happen to stumble into one of the world's foremost experts on biblical texts, the Torah, the ancient tablets in the world. That's who you're talking to right now. Do you understand that the Bible was not written by any of the disciples? He got flabbergasted. I'm like, dude, listen to me. The disciples, if you were to do your studies, they were actually illiterate men. They couldn't read or write. There was nobody standing there transcribing every sentence that they've spoken either. How did the Bible come along, uh, even including the Old Testament? I've, you've heard me say this before. They copied the majority of that stuff from the Enuma Elish, the Atra Hasis, the... Uh, uh, the uh, the Mahabharata, you have some of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, right? You have in there, you have like, for example, the 42 Laws of Mayotte, you know, that's where you get the Ten Commandments that were extracted from that information. You have uh, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. You have the Sumerian Tablets, uh, that are outside of the Enuma Elish. There's many tablets that exist. The Code of Hammurabi, the Epic of Gilgamesh. I mean, that can just keep going and going and going. And I said, then you have the Emerald Tablets, where Jesus's teachings are identical copies of Thoth's teachings from the ancient Kemetic mystery schools taught 50,000 years ago in the land of Kem, which is now known as Egypt. And I could see the steam coming out of this guy's ears. He couldn't even conceive what the heck I was telling him. And I said, do you know that the Bible was written thousands of years after the people were long gone, dead, buried, bones disintegrated and everything else in the ground? He said, no, what are you talking about? I said, listen to me, man. The Bible was written from 100 AD to 900 AD. And who wrote the Bible? Those were followers of Thoth. These people didn't write a Bible, by the way. What they did was they started discovering in different caves and uh, uh, different um, little makeshift uh, buildings that existed a long time ago. These vases with scriptures and cylinder scrolls and papyruses and tablets. And they started collecting them. And they started transcribing that information onto uh, paper parchment paper and, and 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 so forth and so that text that information over time would be studied by the gnostics even in more time much later you have then the coptic christians and then you also have the councils that were formed like for one is the council of nicaea who then started analyzing a lot of these copied and recopied and recopied and recopied and recopied text and started analyzing which ones to keep and which ones to keep out which ones to keep they were thinking let's make this into an actual canonized book we'll take this and put that in here we'll take this this one no that talks about aliens we don't want we don't want the book of enoch in here because he's talking about aliens let's leave that one out we don't want the myth of adapa in here because he's talking about aliens we don't want that in here that's the book of adam we don't want that in here so you have all these apocrypha texts that were kept out right and the Council of Nicaea coordinate and create this, this hod, hodgepodge of a, of, a, of a book based, off ha based on hand-picked content, curated content that they wanted that would allow them to still maintain control over the people, over the masses of people. And that's how you get to the canonized book today that the majority of religious people read around the world, right? It's pretty crazy how in the 21st century, we're still running around believing in that stuff without doing any research about it and still believing that there's a magic sky daddy with a magic wand in the sky waving it at you when you want to when you want somebody to win your basketball game and you want to win a war you people military soldiers actually actually pray to defeat their enemies in war you think that there's a universal creator that can create universes is going to come down into this dimension and grant you a magic wish that you would kill another person. And people actually believe this is true. They believe that this is like, yes, this sounds, this sounds logical to me. The creator of planets and galaxies and universes would love to come down here and let me kill this guy. You see?
You see how stupid? I'm saying it like this so you can see how dumb it sounds. So you can see how stupid it is. It's stupid. It's just outright dumb. And we keep teaching this to kids. And those kids keep teaching it to their kids and their kids. It's ridiculous. I got this house. The Lord, he do what he do. Won't he do it? He gave me this mansion. Meanwhile, around the corner and down the street, there's a kid, a teenager that's homeless. It's homeless. That could be a much better person than I am. But won't he do it? He is good all the time when it refers to you and something that benefited you. But when things don't go your way, it's the other way. Oh, I let the Satan creep in. It is it. Christianity gives you the capability of of uh, of of um, blaming all the good things that happened on this magical magic guy with a wand. And I do mean a man. You guys keep calling him a man. Him, him, he, him, him. There is no such thing as a as a as a, a gender of a god. Doesn't exist. The universe is based off of yin and yang, light and dark. The universe is based off of good and evil. It's based off of that scale. And that means that the energy and the frequency that's creating everything we see in this realm, the divine energy itself, is also a, uh, a, a frequency that has high frequencies and low frequencies built into it. It's a range. And so God is actually a frequency that you tune into. It's not a him or a he that everybody keep running around with. And I can't stand it when I hear women keep calling God a man. It's already bad enough that we've already subjugated you. You couldn't even walk into a church, first of all. That just happened recently. You, you can walk into a church. You would be stoned to death if you walked into a, 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 a temple or a church back in the day. Okay? You just got a little bit of rights recently. You got to vote and things like that. That's not too long ago. And then right away, you're indoctrinated into, into still calling on God as a man, knowing that all life comes from a womb. You know that all life comes from a womb, right? But you're still calling this God a man. Doesn't exist. Not that way. The creator of a universe is not going to come down from outside of the actual universe because whoever created this universe lives on the outside of it, not inside of it. The divine energy and the frequency is here, but the creator itself is not in here or creators, potentially, whoever programmed this code. Inside of here, we are in here. We're fully immersed in it. We have the spark inside of us. We have a choice every single day to do good or do evil. It's up to us. There's no devil whispering in your ear to make you do anything bad. That's the bad thing about religion. It gives you a scapegoat. I can give you a good example. There was a pastor down here at a big mega church, a huge mega church, Calvary Christian. Calvary Christian Academy in, in uh, what's, what city is that in? That is in uh, Pompano Beach, I believe, or Fort Lauderdale. Super mega church, right? This guy molested a little girl, the main pastor guy, molested this little girl. Now, this little girl will most likely grow up completely traumatized. That's something you just don't get over. And potentially not even wanting to follow the route of Christianity because of what happened to her in the church. Now, let me see where the logic comes in this pastor that committed this egregious act against this young girl who destroyed her entire life all he has to do is say oh jesus forgive me for my sins and he can go live in paradise for all eternity but if this girl doesn't beg for jesus's forgiveness and follow that path she's going to burn in a lake of fire do you see how stupid that sounds do you see how dumb that actually sounds it's dumb and we got to stop teaching this garbage. At some point, man, for goodness sake, stop it, please. Recognize the, uh, the foolishness. Recognize how dumb it makes you sound when you actually speak it out loud. Speak this stuff out loud and say it out loud so you can hear yourself. And you go, man, this is really dumb. How in the hell are we following this garbage? All these generations? Then you have the black people that were already here in the Americas and some that were brought here as slaves. And then uh, you put on a, on a plantation that only has about 15, 20 slave owners 
You know, the, the one slave owner and 15 or 20 workers, but there's hundreds of slaves. And there's only like one or two guns and a couple of whips. But how do they hook you in? They tell you this book. This book is your only way out. You have to die to live. You have to you have to suffer and then die so that you can actually begin to live. Meanwhile, they're living now. <laughs> they got they're in paradise. <laughs> You're slaving. They're kill they're making a killing off of you. You see the mental trick? Why are the majority of minorities religious? It goes all the way back to generations ago being beaten, raped into them, tricked into them, right? And then what happens? They literally pass that virus, and I call it a virus, onto their offspring. And then it continues. It's a consciousness virus that continues on through every generation. And it is, it's passed down through epigenetic memories. And those epigenetic memories make you prone to want to actually do this. Now, another place before I sign off tonight that religion has a big place and why people do this, why these cargo cults form, scientists and biologists in laboratories were researching the human genome. And they were wondering, why are human beings so prone to want to worship something? And so they started looking into it pretty heavily and they started analyzing the different genes in the human genome. And they started to realize something. There was a gene that seemed like it was, had to do with the urge for worship. So they said, let's test this one out. See how they were doing this, they were putting these electrodes on people's heads and they were having them have spiritual moments where they would be praying and so forth and so on, trying to analyze which part of the brain was doing this and how it triggered certain genes in the body. Well, they found the gene. It's called a worship gene. Now, what's interesting about this worship gene is they discovered that this worship gene is not that old. It was inserted into the Homo sapien genome around 200,000 years ago. Why is that important? According to the Sumerian tablets, about 200,000 years ago, that's when they decided to uh, take out our, our uh, chromosome number two, fuse it together, and put telomere caps on each end, and get us to do the work for them in the fields as well, around that same 200, 250,000 years ago range. The biologist said that this type of mutation couldn't just happen in 200,000 years. So it was it was purposefully done. Somehow they can't explain it. It should have taken millions of years for something like this to actually evolve in the human body naturally, but it didn't. It just appeared. That's because these people that tinkered with us, these Anunnaki people that tinkered with our genome, these advanced beings that were people, flesh and blood people like you and me, they literally... Uh, took that chromosome number two out, fused it together, put telomere caps on it to shorten our lifespan, as well as inserted a worship gene or activated a worship gene in our body so that we will worship them as gods, do the work for them, bring them the offerings. What do you think the offerings were? If you analyze the Sumerian tablets, you find out what the offerings were. The offerings was their food. If you go to Egypt with me in 2022, we'll go to the temples when people would line up back in the day for miles to bring offerings to the demigods, to the pharaohs and to the Anunnaki that were living and inhabiting some of these temples. And the purpose was they would take that. They have these storehouses built inside the temples where they would take all these offerings and start stack them up. Why? Because these people ain't going out there to kill no damn animals and, and grow no food. No, that's the offering. That's what the offerings were. The offerings were you bringing free food to these people. And in return, you'd get a blessing. Okay? My kid is sick. Can you bless us? Here's my first, my best offering. And you bring them all this meat and all these fruits and vegetables, and they put it in the storehouse. The storehouses are still there to this very day. When you go to Egypt with me, we'll go straight to the storehouses and show you where the Anunnaki used to keep all the food from all the offerings. That's what the offerings were all about. Not paying 10% of your income so that the church can... Uh, have the, oh, the, pay, the pastor can drive a you know a nice car and have have a nice mortgage. It was because originally it started out originally as um, 
you know, bringing us food because we're not going to go hunting, man. We ain't got time for that. We're too busy dominating you guys. And so, you know, you look back at the slave, uh, the slavery times, and you see these slaves, they, they, they got 20 people, 15, 20 people tops ruling over them on one plantation. They don't even say to themselves, you know what? This can't happen. We got to stop this now. Now, we're, certain places, there were some insurrections, but not enough places. Instead, that book, that one book, reprogrammed them so good that even today, there are mega church preachers. I saw this one female mega church preacher. If you look it up on YouTube, you can find it out, find her, find her. She's saying it's a good thing for slavery because if it wasn't for slavery, we would still be worshiping trees in Africa. You see how twisted the brain is? You see how sick that is? Somebody in my family went to their grandfather because they were showing their grandfather how the Palestinian uh, kids in the field were getting picked off by Israeli soldiers, shot phew, for fun. And that relative's grandfather told him they deserve it. Those kids deserve to get shot and killed like that. He's a Christian. The guy's a pastor, actually. And the reason why they deserve it is because they're worshiping the wrong God. Do you see how sick this is? This is why I'm doing this little talk, and I'm going to go into the next few weeks about this. And I'm going to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Because the, 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 the reason for the most killings and death on the planet to date is over two things. Religious beliefs and political beliefs. That's it. Those are the two things that destroyed that have destroyed the, the 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 number of men on the planet. That's why there's four women to every man, four to one. Why the wars going all the way back? The wars primarily over religion. In more modern times, a combination of religion and politics. In certain parts of the world, it's religious, like in the Middle East. And in certain parts of the world, it's more political, like here in America. And then we take advantage of the people that are religious zealots in those other countries. And we use them to fight each other. And then we steal all their stuff. <laughs> we snatch it all up. Right. That's what we did to the Taliban and these guys. Right. We just we just trick them into fighting each other and get them all in this big old thing going on over there. We supply them with all the weapons and everything else and and the Jeeps and stuff. Right. And then after we get them in this big mix. We just snatch it all away. You pull the carpet out from under their feet and snatch everything. <laughs> so it's crazy. So anyway, guys, it's just so much. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I'm going to, this is just part one. There's a lot more I'm going to get into uh, next week and just continue for maybe two or three episodes, maybe three or four episodes of this. We got to really dig deep into what in the world are people running around here believing in? What in the world and who in the world are they praying to? We haven't even got, that's a whole other episode. We're going to tap into who they're praying to on the next episode. They're not praying to God. I'll leave you with this one take. So another guy, people are always trying to convert me into Christianity because they see me walking around with this eye of Horus all the time, right? I used to have the old big, oh, the bigger one on my other clothes, right? They would see me walking around with all my hats and stuff. And right away, they think it's some devil worship, whatever. And they want to convert me. They want to save me. You know, they want to take me out of damnation and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so this one guy, once again, he wants to convert me into Christianity and he's talking to me and he's talking, talking, talking. And I'm just listening to him. And he starts talking about Satan, the devil. I said, tell me more about this Satan, the devil guy. Now, don't keep in mind, anytime I ask you a question, I already know the answer. If I ever ask you a question, I already know the answer. I said, tell me more about this Satan, the Satan, the Satan guy. Tell me more about this guy. I want to know more about him. He starts telling me, oh, he was a cherubim. He wasn't even an angel. And he was, uh, you know, the right hand seat of God at one point. He was the highest, uh, you know, above all the angels. He was he was so smart and intelligent. He was just underneath God in terms of intelligence and and everything else. And he was so beautiful everywhere he went. Music followed him and blah, 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 blah. I said, wow, this. Hmm. I said, so IQ is pretty high, right? Very intelligent. Oh, super intelligent on the level of God. Wow, that's incredible. Interesting. I said, so this super intelligent being is talked about in your Bible, right? Yes. And so what happens to him? Oh, 
well, he's let to he's let out to the, to deceive mankind a couple times, and in the end, you know, he's cast into this lake of fire for all eternity. I said, really interesting. He's cast into a lake of fire for all eternity. I said, and who wrote this book called the Bible? Oh, well, the disciples. I said, no, I had to correct them. The disciples didn't write the Bible. The Bible was written by uh, followers of Thoth Hermes in 180 to 900 AD. Let's get it. Let's get the facts right now. He says, well, either way, he's going to burn in a lake of fire. I said, but did, did man write this text? Yeah. I said, so, but they were under the guidance of God himself. I said, really? Okay. I said, I'll give you that. Maybe you, you believe that. I'm not going to rob you of that. But let's take a look at this for a second. You're talking about a being that's so highly intelligent that he is one notch below the creator of the universe. Maybe even universes. Maybe even the multiverse, right? His IQ is astronomical off the charts. A human is, is not even a rock. A human is dumber than a rock to this entity. And you're telling me that this entity with all this intellect, all this intelligence, all this power is going to follow every word that's written in this book to the T to its own demise. Yes. I said, you know, I have a problem with that. I don't think that's accurate. What I do believe is that this entity has helped to construct and organize this book in this particular format and way that it is so that the majority of the people on the planet would follow it and chase it and pray to him and follow it to their own demise. And his brain caught on fire. <laughs> what Christians don't understand is that they're actually following and chasing and praying to the actual Satan, the same one that they're actually running from. And that is what we'll go over and be pick up in episode number two on the podcast next week. All right. I appreciate every single one of you guys. Love you guys. This podcast was not meant to demean anybody or 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 uh you know hurt anybody it's just sometimes the truth actually does hurt sometimes it cuts like a real knife and if this information uh dug into you a little bit then maybe you need to start doing some research because if you're basing your eternity on one book and one book only you better know every single stitch of every word like i did i broke the bible down from front to back back to front I took it from the King's, from the king's English to, uh, to Aramaic, Arabic, took it down into Hebrew, you know, all the way back into Sumerian. If you're not doing that, an Indian, if you're not doing that, you're not really studying and researching. If you're just looking at a concordance, a concordance is just a validation of the bullcrap, lies, and fabricated information. You must begin to do better work. You must begin to do better work research stop listening to people who stand in front of a thing and just tell you everything and run away with it like it's the gospel right you need to find out for yourself what in the hell are you involved in and what in the heck does it mean and and who wrote this stuff and who created this and why what's the purpose of this information if you're not doing that you're doing yourself a disjustice and all the future generations coming ahead of you are going to be screwed up wasting time Wasting energy, following a bunch of stuff that doesn't even resonate with you once you finally realize what it really is. All right. That's the purpose of this information. All right. Now, shameless plugs always in the beginning, guys. My book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, covers a lot of this information, and it really does a great job in showcasing uh, what the ancients talked about in the Emerald Tablets and what the New Testament of the Bible has to say. And so I kind of correlate the, the verses side by side so you can see, wait a minute, this was copied from the Emerald Tablets. You know, the majority of the New Testament is coming out of the Emerald Tablets, especially where Jesus is speaking. Pretty interesting stuff. Of course, my book, Woke, doesn't mean broke. Another bestseller, financial literacy book. That's available on Amazon and on my website, Forbidden Knowledge. And you can get 30 days free using coupon code 30 days free on 4BK.TV. That's ForbiddenKnowledge.TV. The reason why you want to hop on Forbidden Knowledge TV is because I am going to be doing, after my Manifest Destiny workshop, 
that's coming up. It's a virtual retreat for two days in uh, January 8th and 9th. After that, the rest of the year, all the other seven or eight workshops that I'm doing, they're going to be very big. They're all going to be on Forbidden Knowledge TV, and they're all going to be free only for subscribers. So if you're a subscriber of the TV network, you'll be able to attend all of my big events at no cost. Don't forget the Unite the 99 social media app. It is a social media app that combines features and functions of Instagram and Facebook. You can post videos. You can post swipes. You can you can post uh, uh, all types of images. And links actually are clickable. Links will populate a thumbnail as well. And there's a new dating group in there called Date Conscious. It's a private dating group in the Unite the 99 app. So you can get the app on the App Store and meet conscious people that are into the stuff that you're into. And so you can feel comfortable talking to them right away about whatever you want to talk about because you know that they're on the same frequency as you. So the date conscious group in the United 99 app, check it out. All right. Don't forget about meditation Monday. If you want to be on the text message reminder, text meditation to 954-245-0086. That's 954-245-0086. And I will, um, send you a reminder for Meditation Monday, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday mornings, all right? The origins of religion, all right? You got your tea? 